Welcome to Interviews with Innocence, a podcast about spirituality, consciousness, and exploring the wisdom our children bring into this world. I believe that our very young children are our greatest teachers. After all, they're the masters of living in the present moment, bubbling in unconditional love, enjoying the messiness of life, and curious about the universe in all its dimensions. The pure essence that young children exhibit lives within all of us. My hope is that these interviews will help us discover, embrace, and connect with the sacred core of childhood that resides within each of our hearts. I am your host, Marla Hughes. Hello, I am so happy to have Eileen Davies on the show today. It is truly an honor to have you here, Eileen. Eileen has been working as a medium for over 30 years and has made a lifelong vocation of studying spirituality. She embraces her love of the beauty and diversity of different religious traditions and spiritual practices and has endeavored to integrate a spiritual way of life with her work as a medium. As a child, Eileen frequently kept the company of spirit children who were more a reality than those in the material world and developed a great love of the metaphysical poets from an early age, a love and passion of which Eileen still has today. Eileen is one of the most well-respected mediums in the UK and abroad. She is known for her accuracy, specificity, specificity in her mental mediumship demonstrations and one-to-one readings, giving detailed heart-centered evidence of survival. She is highly valued for her personal integrity and humility. Having served the spirit world for 30 plus years, she is a wellspring of wisdom and experience. She is also a tutor and course organizer at the Arthur Finley College, arguably the most revered college in the world where students can study spiritualist philosophy and religious practice, healing and awareness, spiritual and psychic unfolding, and kindred disciplines. Eileen is devoted to teaching and believes in creating a safe, nurturing environment where all can receive the encouragement that she received in those precious early years. Beautiful, beautiful bio. What a wonderful, what a wonderful way to start. And I can attest to, um, I was actually, I don't know if you know this, Eileen, was I was planning on coming to Arthur Finley, which I am now in September to be with you. But um, about a year ago, I was planning on coming just to see you and spend time with you. And then I found out you were coming to my area. I couldn't believe it. I was able to participate in a beautiful, I hate to even call it workshop, a beautiful session with you. And and I want to thank you for that. And everything in your bio is absolutely true. I can attest to that. So let's get started. So you talk about um, keeping the company of spirit children um, as a young child. And then this, how this unfolded into this beautiful journey of not only mediumship, but spirituality. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, Absolutely. Of course, I'd love to share. Sharing is such an important thing to do. Obviously, I believe that a lot of children live very, very much in their spiritual selves. And it's part, uh, an inherent part, a connection to God, to spirit, to have an awareness of um, other realities and other other spirit children um, and it was so very natural as a child you haven't got comparison all you can ever offer to the world is your own experience and so there were times when I was playing and speaking to um, spirit children that adults couldn't see and it's something that very often happens now you hear and I think it always has basically you hear parents describing um, their children as very often keeping the company of imaginative uh, friends uh, who they can't see or be aware of. So I think it's the important thing is is to nurture this. It's not to overcompensate, um, but to just acknowledge it, that it is a reality for that child. Because I was very fortunate in as much as I had tremendous proof 
many, many years later in my mediumistic journey, where I had proof from one of our most respected spiritual mediums in the spiritualist movement that all I'd been experiencing was real. Now, that was quite an epiphany for me because there was part of my life where I thought maybe they weren't real, maybe they were a figment of my imagination. So to have somebody um, else can give me confirmation that yes, they were real, it, it was such a beautiful experience. Yes. And tell us a little bit about the spiritualist church, because I know it's not re- really a religious affiliated. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and and the journey? Because I know you started this journey, especially after your, your father passed. Very, very much so. Um, spiritualism in the UK is actually recognized as a religion, a philosophy and a science. So that's a very, very beautiful thing. And that essentially happened because of what one particular medium went through and it brought a change, a turnaround in people's thinking. So that's that's quite something lovely. But the Spiritualist Church is basically where people of like minds meet together. Um, There is very often a tremendous fellowship because if you go through your life thinking what you're experiencing is a bit different from everybody else, When you go, or when I went through the doors of a spiritualist church, for me, it was like coming back home. It was like finding Mm. myself again, so to speak. So a spiritualist service is um, normally consists of a prayer, a prayer from the heart, not a prayer that's a repetition of words that somebody else said two and a half thousand years ago, but uh, a prayer where there is a deep connection and then an inspired talk and then a demonstration of survival. So the communication is a very, very essential part of a spiritualist service because it's proving, it's proving and supporting that life is eternal by bringing evidence of survival. Yes. And when was kind of your aha moment that it was, this is all really true? I'm just not seeing things. I, I feel personally that I always knew in in my own heart um and I often say because I believe it very very strongly that you know we go through life um as children with an openness a generosity of spirit children don't know how to judge that's a learned condition that we experience or they learn from adults so I I was very very fortunate in so many ways because I really um had this connection although i have to say after a particular age it wasn't as strong as when i was a child um and then because my father passed at a relatively young age in my life when i was young and he was indeed relatively young as well it made me want to search for answers yes. and so when i went through the doors of a spiritualist church it was a, a moment where hey these people are celebrating that life is eternal so for me it was confirmation um, of what i felt within but then um i think secondly was that moment where i received my first communication uh from my father and i i will never ever forget the feeling that that gave me it, it totally transformed my life and turned my life around because um, it touched me in a way that I thought, I have to share this. This is too big or something to want to keep to myself. I really want to share. But then I learned that you can only help people who are ready yes. spiritually. Some people, maybe it's not their time this life or at this moment in their life to awaken to the realization that they're eternal beings. So I think it's something that even sometimes the greatest proof, the best proof in the world, will not convince someone who's not inwardly ready to hear. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, at the moment, there is a tremendous shift going on in the very consciousness of mankind. I don't think ever before has there been so many people following or exploring spiritual pathways and looking at ways to live an authentic life live a good life, a life that has value and meaning and purpose. And for me, when we know we're eternal beings, 
it takes you through the doorway of transformation and self-realization. Absolutely. Well, I believe when we do a spiritual practice or when we meditate, it opens us to the mystery of being alive. Uh, it, and um, we do a spiritual practice, not just for ourselves, but by virtue of doing that practice, it enables somebody somewhere else we've never met to discover that self-same power and ability within their own selves. So it's, it's very, very valid and very real. And, and that's yes. something I think that um, is important. A lot of people have a concept uh, that people who are involved in spiritual things um, a little bit, you know, not in the real world, but my my belief is we're more in the real world. Yes, that's that's beautiful. Well, you you say that mediumship and spiritual practice, um, it's a journey back to discovering who you really are, the unfolding of the divine power that is inherent in all of us, a door that will lead us to the threshold of our own awakening. So can you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I think um, it's very easy to get caught up in um, all the the needs and demands of life and existence. And we forget ourselves. Who is the real self? We're not the sum totality of this physical body we've shown up in. After all, um, you know, who were we before we were born? Yes. I, I've often meditated on that. Um, that very thought, you know, who am I? Who is the real self? The self that perceives, the self that is the the place of pure consciousness and pure love. So I believe it's stripping away everything that would make us believe in this full self, that we are just the body. So spirituality, mediumship, it is about discovering that the body is just a piece of clothes that we've shown up in this life. And one day we will kiss it goodbye. When we've outgrown it, um, when it no longer serves it a, serves a purpose, we will leave it behind. But the real essence of who we are, the spirit within, will move on. Yes. And could you explain a little bit about moving on, I've always believed that we go home. We do. And, and what, is that, what is that home like? Has the spirit world shared, shared that with you when we go home? I, I, I know that very often in communications from those in the spirit world, they have expre- expressed how there is a feeling of going through an experience where they see their entire life yes, life before their awareness. And that's a very, very common thing with people who have had out-of-body experiences. Um, there's a shared common theme there, which is wonderful. Um, so, but the spirit communications um, have, have said exactly the same thing, which supports those who have had near-death experiences, where they they see their life and they experience their life from a deep soul, from the deepest place in their soul. And the whole drama and story of their journey moves through their conscious awareness in a moment. And they have an experience of how their actions affected the lives of those around them. Mm. And invariably, the spirit world always express how we go on learning and progressing. There isn't, there isn't, um, a, everything in life is progressing, evolving and expanding all the time. So they very often describe, and this is through the trance communications, and sometimes through communications from loved ones as well, where they speak about just the thought of, desire to be in the company or presence of someone they know and love it's as though the thought carries them there yes which is such a beautiful thing it's as though love is a magnet that draws each to his own because very often people worry how will they find their loved ones well i don't think we have to find them they find us 
Yes. But I feel the power of love and connection draws us to one another. And I do believe that part of the process of evolving and refining ourselves is something that we encounter and experience when we move on to the next reality. I, in truth, you see, the spirit world have often said, in reality, we've never left the spirit world. And I think that's a lovely concept. We're only fooled into thinking we've left the other world. Um, because we create separation in our thinking, such as here and there, life and death. But really, the power within us is still experiencing life in this other reality. It happens when we meditate. It can happen some, possibly even sleep. A very, very common thing is that when people experience loss and the pain of, of grief, that they wake up um, after a night's sleep and there is a remembrance of having been together with a the person they love. Yes. And, and that's such a beautiful thing. And it seems from my experience and from other stories that those dreams are different because, Absolutely. yeah, they're just so vivid and they're real. They're and real. That's, that's the key word, real, that it leaves you with a essence of a feeling that this is real. This isn't just, you know, something that I've been processing in the dream states, but it's been a reality. And I, I think that a lot, a lot of people I've met over the years who, you know, have experienced um, loss of people that they love very deeply have had this common experience. Sometimes they can't quite recall the experience. Um, on waking, they lose it, but there's always a residual feeling left of what had occurred. Yes, beautiful. And I'm um, talking about one's physical life. Um, it seems today that it's very different, or it's it's totally separate many times from the spiritual life, and that really they they should go together. Could you expand on that a little bit? Uh, I do. I think sometimes uh, now in our society, in our world, there's a lot of pseudo-spirituality. Yes. Um, people think they can buy into spirituality. Um, but I, I believe the spiritual life is a life when we live from our deeper self, from our authentic self. Um, we are who we are. I think it's too great a burden to try and be perfect. That's too great a task. Um, but I, I, I believe if we move towards perfecting love and loving and that we look beyond an action when maybe somebody um, hurts us, when somebody else causes us suffering, is not to look at the action but look maybe to the reason why they behaved in that way. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm living a perfect life. I'm living far from a perfect life. But <laughs> I feel that it's about bringing effort and living a life with a, an awareness of the needs of those uh, around and, and being present. You see, I believe very passionately that nowadays in our society, in this um, world of technology, that we're forgetting the art of really communicating with one another. Mm-hmm. Um, to really communicate, we have to engage in the totality of being deeply present with someone. So we're listening in a way where we're connecting to their, their deeper essence, their deeper need, what they're saying beyond the words. What are their silences saying? And then I always try to listen to somebody's voice. So as I'm listening to somebody's voice, I allow myself to be touched on a deeper level by their presence and sometimes by the suffering that they're holding on to or they don't want the world to know about. Right. Oh, that's what what a beautiful thought provoking thought to to go go through life like that because I another quote I love, you said we want to let our lives become a testimonial of love of what we believe. 
Uh, and absolutely. and how could you comment on when you've worked with children or spirit children and how the importance of us modeling or living that kind of life and what that does for our very young and how our very young rem- rem- reminds us to live that way. Absolutely, because children have the capacity just to live in the moment. That there's a ma- and there's such a magic that as adults we lose and we forget. You know, a child can look at a flower and see the wonder and the beauty of it. And I, I believe children remind us of how we should be perceiving the world. We should be perceiving the world through new eyes. Every time we meet someone, every time we look at something, seeing its beauty, seeing its loveliness. I was very, very blessed some years ago to attend a a satsang with a a spiritual teacher called Muji. And afterwards, uh, bless his heart, he gave everybody, and there must have been about 500 people there, a hug. And I have to say, having this hug created um, just an outpouring of love from deep within me. And everybody I saw after that, it was as though I saw deep into their soul. And it's like the eyes were the the window to the soul. And you could feel the other person's presence in such a deep, profound way. I think it's quite a remarkable, remarkable experience. And so I try now, when I meet someone, is to look at them. And not see the outer form, the outer appearance or what clothes they've got on, but by seeing really see who they are as a spiritual being. Mm-hmm. I think children do that gracefully and naturally. And their life happens. How can we teach children? I believe we can only teach people by example. Beautiful. Because too many people adults say oh you can't do that you can't but then they do it themselves so yes. how can, it's the only real way to teach is through being the example is by showing the way and the way of kindness and unconditional love and and understanding because understanding is such a powerful quality because it means we're you're not looking at somebody and you're labeling them or judging them it means that you recognize that here is a need within someone. Or maybe the person in front of you has had a life where they haven't really felt love. So it it creates this deepening within us. Mm -hmm. And for the child, I'm sure just the energy of that, of watching as as an adult models that, the energy of that love that they that they feel which which brings about healing also and i know at, before you really got into mediumship you were very interested in healing and of course it all goes together and can you comment on that i i believe that um very strongly that every moment is an opportunity to heal and obviously in the spiritualist movement we would um allow ourselves to become the channel for the healing power to flow through us but we can heal somebody by our presence Mm -hmm. if we have true acceptance if we allow the grace of pure love to flow through us we can heal others through the power of the spoken word if each word encourages someone else and makes them realize that maybe they're being too self-critical you see we're so condition bound and we are we unfortunately now collectively have to fight against you know being being labeled being judged and all the all the while when we feel we're being labeled and judged we're coming from a place of fear rather than love yes um because energy energy will always follow thought um energy flows where attention goes so if we, um, if somebody we meet is very um, fearful, they haven't encountered a lot of love, then possibly showing them love, um, and that is very often by just accepting someone for who they are, not having any expectations, 
you know, we are, we all are as we are, and nobody is perfect. And I think, you know, that's one of the mysteries of life is discovering that, you know, there is perfection in imperfection. There is also beauty um, in, um, in a flaw as well, you know. So I, I feel it's something that when we live a life of true awareness, uh, then we move beyond the conditions and the labels that we put upon ourselves, but also other people as well. Yeah. And, and I love when you say we just need to get ourselves out of the way. Yeah. yeah that's it exactly it you know when we begin to start to truly give um we can really develop compassion and empathy within ourselves for another um i think mother Teresa once said a very very beautiful saying we draw our family circle too small uh, uh, and do you know that is so true because um socrates said a very very a beautiful saying as well which supports that in many many ways he said that i don't know i wasn't around at the time so i can't tell you <laughs> exactly but he allegedly said that i'm not an athenian or a, or a greek i'm a citizen of the world and when you're a citizen of the world everybody is your family and i think mother teresa's saying we draw our family circle too small we need to take away the barriers and the perimeters and the limitations and embrace the whole of the human family. Yeah. And some people say, oh, that's too idealistic. What about people who have caused suffering? But maybe there's a reason why they're behaving in that way. And, and that's what my spiritual truth has taught me. Mm -hmm. We must, to be truly free, we can only be free when we are removed from labeling and judging others. Oh, absolutely beautiful beautiful so how do we tap into this beautiful awareness and becoming living you know in the present I know you talk about the importance of breathing and also that you practice a beautiful meditation I think it's um, metta, metta. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. yes yes can you tell us about um, that I think the breath is of the breath is so incredible. It's sustaining us, isn't it, for our physical journey here. But if you think of the concept that we all share one another's breath, it's got a beautiful way of uniting us all. Mm. And, you know, really, when we breathe in, we are breathing in the recycle air that somebody somewhere else maybe years and years ago has breathed in. And when we allow ourselves to practice just truly being present in the breath. And then my, my favorite uh, meditative practice is definitely metta, which is loving kindness. It's taking our awareness to the heart and allowing our focus just to begin with embracing ourselves in loving kindness. Because most people aren't kind to themselves. It's true, isn't it? We, yes. We, you know, we, we take on board so many expectations and demands and then we fall out with ourselves and we're not happy in our own skin. So learning to love ourselves, we spend the first part of the meditative practice on just that one concept and it begins to grow like a seed within you. Because I, my whole life, I was a perfectionist. Um, everything I do, I've got to do it perfectly. And I've had to sort of unlearn that, if that makes sense. Um, and embrace it. It's okay. You know, whatever it is, however it looks, however I am, however I look, it's okay. Um, and I, I think there's such grace and art in that. So meta is about just steadily allowing our awareness and attention to be placed in the heart and just wrapping our own selves in self-acceptance and self-love. And then the second step is to bring to your awareness people that you've met in your life. Firstly, those you love in your family, those who you love who aren't a family member, but of the greatest spiritual family. 
Um, and just think of all these people, bring them to the light of awareness and direct your loving kindness to them. And then lastly, well, is people who have caused you suffering. Yes. And that's, that's the biggest challenge, challenge because sometimes the head tells us we've forgiven, but the heart tells us a different story. So we're very often, as we are thinking we've forgiven, when we become aware of this person in our meditative state, we become aware that there's these underlying currents of maybe feelings that we haven't quite come to terms with or where we haven't fully forgiven. So then your practice moves towards accepting that you too um, haven't always behaved or acted perfectly. Mm-hmm. So therefore that other person is the same as you. Yes. Where, where can we all unite? We can unite together in our common kindred divinity, the spirit within. Beautiful. And wow. And you also talk about the importance of prayer, which I love. So could you expand on that a little bit? And I know George Higginson was one of your one of your teachers. I've read I've read a lot about him. And could you talk a little bit about pr- the importance of prayer? Prayer is uh, incredibly important. Um, it creates its own power and its own energy. Now, for me, real prayer is saying the living word. It's being in the moment and feeling the prayer. And when we really pray or we pray for another, it changes the person who prays. We are no longer the same person we were before that moment because we've reached out, being touched by a need within another. And we've reached out in prayer. So I believe prayer isn't just about liberating the inner voice of the eternal within us. It's about awakening this power where we move from the limitations of the physical form that we're in and We touch others. You know, sometimes it's being held in the prayers of others that have kept me going in my life when I've had a need. And I believe if I can, in turn, pray for another when they have a need, it's such, it's creating in the universe a very positive power. People from all spiritual religions at any given moment in time When you're praying, irrespective of the spiritual or religious tradition they come from, are united by the intent of prayer. Beautiful. Wow. And do you think that that teaching our young children to meditate and and or do you is is important or is it more just them seeing us practicing these these spiritual practices i personally believe that if we could incorporate teaching children to meditate right from the first years of their school life it would bring about a change in the generations to come because you see the struggles um, that they go through and encounter. A child moves into the teenage years, and then there's all the temptations and distractions now in our society. So meditation allows us to experience the connection, this deep connection with who we really are. Because everybody has a point where they feel this deep, abiding need to know their self. Who am I? How do you fit in in the grand scheme of life? What is your part? What is your role? What have you come here to bring as an offering to the world? So I think if we taught children how to meditate, that would in some measure help them not to lose that connection with self. And that indeed in its own way would be an anchor. Yes, it would inner strength. With that this anchor where they are rooted in themselves. And to be able to navigate a little bit better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Around and through all the distractions in, in life now that would try and tempt you away from 
the realization of who you really are. Okay. Yes, I, I think if I think if I would have started meditating at a very young age, you know, I, I it would have been a very different a very different life for for me. That that's beautiful, and. I, I'd like for you to just speak on the importance of validating our own feelings and young children's feelings and everyone's. Absolutely, because at the end of the day, um, our world is created by through by our lens of perception. So what somebody believes is real, what they're experiencing, whether they feel isolated in their life, a little bit alienated or not included, even though that might not be what's happening to them, it's real. So I feel we just have to support people and understand children, people, um, when they're going through a time when they feel cut off from life and for their own selves. So it's about allowing space for people to be able to honor what they are going through, whether it's something Uh self-inflicted, self-imagined, self-created, it's valid. If it's valid to them within that moment, then we have to help navigate them through that difficulty. And that means not by judging them, but by allowing, by listening and being present for someone. Mm -hmm. And that's why if I can go back to when I said earlier, when we really listen to someone to the tone of their voice, because the voice carries the intention of the heart. The, the, the voice speaks, um, if we really listen, if we have the capacity to hear beyond words to what somebody is really saying within, how they're really perceiving themselves in, in reality, within the dynamics of the family they're in, or in their school, or in their adult life, in their work. So I, I believe the sickness, sadness of our times is that we don't allow people the grace and the space of allowing each other to be heard, truly heard. Mm-hmm. We need to listen, listen, listen more from our hearts. Absolutely. To listen more from our hearts. For everyone. Absolutely. For er- to everyone. Well, and... I also love the Sufi saying that you talk about, and I try to live by now, and it's the three gates. Mm -hmm. Yes. So tell us about that. Um, It's been a source of inspiration to me. The first time I read that beautiful saying, well, I think I was about 18 years old, Mm. and it touched me deeply because it's beyond any religious um traditions and conditionings it's simple it can speak to everybody in a language that everybody can understand before you say anything is it kind is it necessary and is it true it must pass through those three gates if we could forget all the isms and tear away everything that separates one another from each other whether it be the class whether it be religious Um, background they come from or culture or you know anything like that strip it all away and meet at that place where we embrace one another and what do we bring as an offering to the world Um, can I meet you from a place where I'm not going to say anything unkind I'm not going to think anything unkind and it is what I'm thinking true yeah so it's um it's so important. I think we, we, it's important that we look at places where we all unite and not what divides. And our society now, our world is calling us to look at commonalities, look at places <laughs> where we can experience a sharing and a meeting point. Yes. Do, do you think there is, I, I feel a transformation, you know, coming about. Do you? I think there's enormous transformation coming about. Never before has consciousness been aware of consciousness. Has God been aware of God in the way that humankind is aware now? Never before have people been searching and questioning and looking for something that sustains 
us all from the inside. Yes. Uh, and that's what we really need to do, looking at um, nourishing our inner life, our soul, our spirit within. That, that's such an important place. And I believe every spiritual tradition has a part to play. But at the same time, we need to be progressive and forward thinking and on a unity and diversity. Mm-hmm. Um, it's quite exciting times because never before has somebody that's been brought up into Hinduism gone and become a Buddhist and, and likewise. So there is a great exploring now. People aren't adopting the religious conditioning of the past. They're thinking for themselves. Yes, which is so beautiful. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, God is too big for one religion. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. And, and love is what is essentially the essence of all religious and spiritual traditions. So mm-hmm. let's look at the meeting place, which is love. Yeah. So what do you think we as adults and young children can learn from one another and help help each of us to remember the divine? I think... I believe when we are mindful, when you look at a flower, its beauty and perfection is reflecting its own divinity. When you gaze into the eyes of another, you see mirror back your own innate divinity. So there's a magic in allowing ourselves the grace of truly being present. You see, we can hurry by something and not see it. But when we stop to see it, it reminds us of our own innate nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, spiritual practices, um, being more mindful, being more present, um, you know, meditation, prayer, uh, trying to live a life where we are beautifying the mind, really. (laughs) <laughs> I, I think if we can learn the art of cultivating a beautiful mind, then we're adding something beautiful to life. Why, why are we here? You know, every spiritual seeker has asked themselves that. I mean, it's like the universe is a great symphony, and we add our own melody to the symphony. We're adding our own unique quality and vibration that didn't quite exist before we arrived here. Yes. And we take it home with us. We do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because where have we come from? We have come from heaven and home. We have come from the spiritual realities before we were born. And we drew our first breath and exchanged energies with the universe Where were we? We've come from heaven and home. Now we've taken on the limitations of a physical body, but still with the capacity to know love and God and the divine within all. (laughs) Wow. So I love this quote from you. Um, I'm just going to, when you were asked, what do you want to share with the world? You said, I want to share the miracle that we are divine beings Understanding transforms our life, enriches our lives. The trust releases its own power. Relationships based on trust. Now we have to take it to feelings as feelings are the voice of the spirit. Feelings give the life to everything. I don't know if I did that verbatim or not, if that was grammatically correct, but... um, yeah, so so just expand on that. Now you say, you tell me what, what you want to share with the world. That life is a miracle, that each and every single moment is an opportunity to grow, to evolve, to love, to experience the joys of life, uh, the wonders, the miracle of creation of who we are, who each other really is. You know, what, what I always... I try now when I meet someone to look and and feel and connect and what is this person's offering to life? What are they bringing to the world? Um, It is a miracle that life is eternal, that we are eternal beings. 
So don't live like we're going to run out of time tomorrow because, you know, eternity means we are, we are limitless. Right. It doesn't mean we have endless time. Eternity means we are limitless. The real self is eternal. So therefore, everything in life is, is magic if you look through the eyes of wonder and really look through the eyes of love, through the eyes of a child, because that's what they remind us to do time and time again. So everything, we can either look and perceive the world through the eyes of fear or love. When we um, connect with love, we orientate everything energetically to the vibration of that which is positive and that which is whole. And love is the greatest gift we can give or add to life and existence itself. Beautiful. Well, Eileen, thank you so much. Is, is, is there anything you'd like to share that, that I didn't, didn't ask you about today? I, I think that um, a spiritual teacher, Ramana, um, once when I read his books many years ago, uh, he was once asked by one of his devotees or followers, um, how should you treat others who, when they've hurt you? and um, cause you suffering and Ramana was quiet for a moment and then he replied there are no others oh wow and when we look at the world through an angle of vision where we're separate we begin to align ourselves more with the ego which distracts us which takes us away from aligning and connecting with our spirit. Mm -hmm. So I believe that wonderfully powerful saying, there are no others. When you look through the eyes of love and you look at the world and realize that there are, they aren't separate from me, that where we unite is the miracle of our divinity. Where we meet is, is the power of our infinite spirit. I think that is, that changes who we are. That changes who we are. Yes, and how we walk in this life. Absolutely. I mean, if everything in our life was taken away from us, what would we have left? We come into the world with nothing. We leave with nothing. What have we got other than the gift of who we are, our own self? So yeah. how much we've loved, how much we've allowed the power to permeate through our life and yeah, it doesn't mean we go around being holier than now or anything like that or looking down upon another because when you realize there are no others, you, there's nobody to look down or up to. We're all one. We're all equal. Yeah, beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I will, I will certainly walk through this life much differently today and <laughs> hopefully forever. Um, if people would like to find you, what is the what is the best way? Yes, I have a website, um, and it's Eileen Davies, just EileenDavies.com. Okay. Yeah. Great. And that will. There. Okay, and that will be the show notes. And and um, look up Arthur Finley College, where Eileen Absolutely. teaches a lot of classes. And I'll be going in September. Yes, yes. Wonderful. To be Wonderful. with you. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. And oh, um, you have, a, have a beautiful day. And you. And, and have thank a you. Birthday. Yes, thank you for the birthday wishes. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks, dear friend. Look after yourself. God bless. Okay. God bless. Thank you so much for listening in today. If you want to learn more about the show, you can find us at interviewswithinnocence.com and on Facebook or Instagram at interviewswithinnocence. Please write me a message. Tell me what you liked and let me know what else you would like to hear. I would love to hear from you. And if you liked what you heard, please leave us an iTunes rating and review. It helps other listeners find the show. Thank you. Thank you.